At Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary, we believe theological education should be confessional. Because of our desire to identify with what Christ has done in His church throughout the centuries, we fully adhere to the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. This standard keeps us accountable and preserves us from novelty. For more information on how you can receive informed scholarship with Pastoral Heart, check out our website, cbtseminary.org. The Covenant Podcast exists to equip listeners with theological content from a 1689 Baptist perspective. We pray you find this resource edifying, faithful to Scripture, and Christ-exalting. Now, let's get started. Welcome to the Covenant Podcast. Austin McCormick here, and I have the privilege to welcome Dr. James Eglinton on the podcast today. Thanks, so, Austin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're going to be talking about Herman Bovink, but before we uh, get into his life and ministry, can you start off our discussion on Bovink by telling us and our audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So, my name, as you said, is James Eglinton. I'm from Scotland. I live in Edinburgh and I teach at the University of Edinburgh. I teach Reformed Theology here and I've been on the faculty for the last seven years. Um, I grew up in the Highlands of Scotland um, and um, grew up in a Christian home and um, studied law at university and then went to seminary, moved on from that to be an assistant pastor and did a PhD at the same time. When I finished both of, both of those things, I moved to the Netherlands and I worked for a, a, a university there on the theological faculty for three years and then came back to Edinburgh seven years ago. Yeah, thank you for uh, telling our audience a little bit about yourself and thank you for um, joining us today to talk about Herman Bovink. Um, you have translated some of Bovink's works and have written on his theology before. Um, what prompted you to write a critical biography about him, and what are some of the prior biographies Bovink misunderstood about him and his thought? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, as I said, I did my PhD on him, but it was on his theology rather than him as a person or his life story. And uh, so it was on how he understood the Trinity as something that is revealed in a general sense. So in Reformed theology, we're committed to the idea that, that God reveals himself generally um, in the world around us, and then in a special way um, through scripture and, and the person of Christ. So my PhD was on Bavink and how he understood the Trinity as revealed through general revelation, um, which is to say that for Bavink, he thought that the character of the world itself is somehow like the Trinity. It's a general revelation of the triune God. Um, so the world itself is one big thing, but it's made up of lots of different things that all exist together in a, in a, in a beautiful kind of harmony. And it's like that for Bavink because of um, who God is as the creator of that world. So God is three persons in one Godhead. So I'd spent all this time looking at his theology and really digging deep to try and understand something that's as basic, but also as huge in his thought as what is, what's the world like? What's the cosmos like? And why is it that way in relation to who God is and what God is like? Um, so the more I read of his works and then um, the more I tried to write about his theology, I think the better a sense I got of, of how I thought his thought had developed over the course of his lifetime, because theology is never written um, in a vacuum. Uh, it's always written by real people and they're addressing specific things in their own contexts. And I just got a sense of, of how Bavink's thought developed that, that I guess took place over years of reading his work and trying to write about it. And as you say, trying to translate some of it into English as well. Um, so I got, the, I had this sense that was developing of, of how his thoughts changed and matured over his lifetime and how you understand his later works as being obviously later works and his early works as being, you know, the work of a, like a, an early 30 something theologian instead. And then when I looked at the biographies that were out there, um, there have been quite a few, um, but I couldn't see that in any of them, Bavink as I understood him as a person and in terms of the development of his life, I couldn't see how that was really conveyed in any of the previous biographies. Uh, so there are two major Dutch biographies. Um, one was written quite quickly as Bavink was dying and then after he died. And um, 
it has its own uh, you know take on Bavinck's life and developments, and it's pretty different to how I understand Bavinck. Um, and it's also a biography that includes lots of sensational details that are historically problematic um, or demonstrably impossible. Um, but it's a really entertaining read. It's it's a it's a it's a fun biography to read through. Um, there was another big biography that came out in the Netherlands in the 1960s. That's a very careful scholarly kind of biography, um, but it's very much attuned to Bavink and his public life. So he was a big name public figure. He was a politician. He was a newspaper editor. He was a you know huge theologian, and he moved in, in those kinds of elite public circles. Um, but I just through reading lots of his diaries and letters and um, all those unpublished sources, as well as his published sources, um, I was really interested in who his friendships were with people who weren't big name politicians or intellectuals. So, uh, and this other, the second big Dutch biography doesn't really get into that. It's very much the public life, the public thinker. So it's one side of Bavink, but I thought there was another side that needed to come out. And I thought that you could do that in a responsible scholarly way because he left us with um, lots and lots of journal entries and letters um, newspaper articles that are kind of biographical in nature and actually I found one autobiographical newspaper article that he wrote for a Dutch language newspaper in America in, in Michigan that was completely unknown to scholarship before then um, but it's the and it's the only known auto autobiographical sketch by Herman Bavink. So I found all this other stuff and thought I could really put this together and say something new about Bavink and shed a, a lot of new light on who he was uh, that then informs what how we see what he wrote. Um, there is one other English biography that came out about a decade ago, but it's very much like a paraphrase of, of the two Dutch biographies. So it takes what's in those biographies and then um, kind of combines them and then renders it in English. Um, but because it's based on the two Dutch biographies, it, it's um, it's just quite different to what I've tried to do, which is go back to the sources the whole way, um, spend years in archives and um, reading through all of his stuff and then say what the sources require you to say, um, because it's there, it's in his diary, so you can't omit it. Um, but also what the sources will allow you to say. So you, you can't just make this stuff up. You have to have something there in a, in a source that lets you add this detail to, to the biography. And that's actually what a critical biography is. So that was baked into your question, why did I want to write a critical biography? So it's a, it's a specific genre of biography that is based on historical sources. So um, you're not writing realistic historical fiction. You don't, you're not like, at liberty just to ad lib and make up things about your characters. Um, you have to follow the sources in order to make your account of these lives authoritative. So critical biography is a really um, useful and valuable way to write someone's life story. Um, it's not critical in the sense of trying to destroy Herman Bavink or leave his reputation in tatters. It's, it's critical as a kind of historical scholarship. Um, but he left such great resources behind to do that kind of historical work with. So um, I thought that was just a, a shame that we didn't have a critical biography in that specific sense, given everything that he left us. Well, thank you for that. Um, moving the conversation on, and, and uh, you've mentioned how you've studied Bob Vink and uh, the critical biography you've written about him. Can you now just give our audience a biographical sketch on Bob Vink, perhaps a little bit about his life, his theological development, his influence, his family, his friends, his impact? Hmm. Well, so he was from the Netherlands, and he was born in 1854 in the middle of the Nether uh, the middle of the 19th century, and he died in 1921, so early in the 20th century after the First World War. And he was born and he died in really different worlds. Um, so much stuff changed in um, Western culture between those decades. So when we think of the Netherlands now, um, the kind of stereotype that we have of the Netherlands is that it's an extremely liberal country. Um, it's the most liberal of liberal democracies out there. People are, are really famously free to say exactly what they think and live exactly as they wish. Um, but the Netherlands that Bavink was born into was um, it was at a state of like infant democracy. 
So it had become a democracy in 1848. So that's only six years before he was born. And before that, it was actually um, ruled by an authoritarian king um, who had uh, who, who would persecute um, rel religious dissenters in all kinds of alarming ways. Um, so if you were an outsider um, in the first half of the 19th century, then you had a pretty difficult life, especially if you were a religious dissenter. And the Bavink family were. Uh, so they were part of a denomination that had left the mainstream Dutch Reformed Church, and that was the church that the king favoured. Um, they left it over state control of the church, or state control over their worship, um, theological liberalism. But it was actually illegal to be reformed and not be in the state Reformed Church at that period, um, when the Bavink family first left the, the state church. So that was the kind of background that his family came from. And when you read their stories, it's really the kind of stuff that you would associate with um, with East Asian countries today, or some of them anyway, rather than Western Europe. Um, so um, you're talking about church services being stopped by the police, pastors being beaten up, um, taken away, fined, imprisoned. Um, you're talking about really crippling social um, restrictions that come with being a member of this church and where it's actually just illegal. So the church is an underground church in a sense. Um, you know, the church would hold services in in, the, in forests um, where they thought the police couldn't find them or in barns. So they came from that background. And um, But just a few years before Herman was born, the country had become a democracy and there was a democratic revolution. So democracy is this brand new thing and, and everyone's trying to work out what does it mean? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What should Christians think about it? Um, how do you raise children in this brand new kind of society. So he grows up in that kind of a context. His father was a pastor in this church, the Christian Reformed Church. It was, so this kind of conservative church that had seceded from the Dutch Reformed Church. Um, his parents were also part of the new middle class. So that's also a big social change that's happening. There's the creation of a middle class and a knowledge-based economy. So you have these really ambitious parents, uh, like Herman Bavink's parents, who, who really push their kids into um, quite modern educational tracks. So he was sent through really excellent schooling and they had quite high ambitions for him and what he could achieve. And they very much wanted their children to be faithful to their Christian commitments, but also to be active and engaged at the center of their modern democratic culture. Um, so he grows up in that kind of a context. Um, so part of a church that's ecclesiastically separate but also where a lot of people want to be culturally engaged. So he com comes from a really interesting context, and he's a, he was really smart. Um, he he studied us at a small seminary, his church's seminary, for a year, but then transferred to the the biggest, oldest, um, and at that time most you know prestigious, but also theologically the most well a very liberal um, theological faculty at the University of Leiden. So he studied there and um, emerged with his with his faith intact, um, but having been stretched and challenged in many directions, um, and he stayed on for a doctorate as well, which he did in ethics, um, Ulrich Zwingli's ethics. He then became a pastor for about a year and a half in a small town. He found that a really lonely experience. Um, he moved on from that to teach at a seminary, at his denomination's own seminary in Campen. And he stayed there for two decades, so small, unaccredited seminary. Um, and he wrote the first edition of his Reformed Dogmatics there, which is the work that um, he's best known for today. He got married in that period. Um, he did all kinds of interesting things as well as theology um, that then become evident in the last two decades of his life because he moved to the Free University of Amsterdam, which was established as a private Christian university. So you could think of something like um, like Wheaton College or something like that, um, but established in Amsterdam in the, the late 19th century by Abraham Kuyper, who was one of Bavink's, who became Bavink's colleague. Um, so he's part of this movement um, in this phase of his life that became known as Neo-Calvinism. And it's, it was an attempt to take the resources of the historic Calvinist tradition and use that to answer the questions of the modern age. So it's not a denial of what came before in Calvinism, but it's an attempt to use it to expand the Calvinist tradition 
to address questions about modern science or modern society or politics. So these questions of new things that were emerging all the time, um, the second industrial revolution, uh, the, the world is changing all around them. Um, Colonialism is coming to an end. The world's becoming a more globalized environment. Um, so Calvinism needs to answer all of these questions in order for people to think Christianly about their lives. So the neo-Calvinist movement is an attempt to do that. So Bavinck is really the, I guess, the the foremost thinker in the neo-Calvinist tradition. Uh, and then that kind of takes you into the the last two decades of his life, which then overlap with uh, World War One. He has a heart attack after that and then has a period of decline for maybe a year and a half or so, and then dies. Um, so that is the, the life of Herman Bavinck in a nutshell. I, uh, as I read the biography, one of the interesting parts was he did take a few trips to the United States of America, and Bavinck was very different, or at least his opinions were very different from between the first and the second time. So what were his thoughts of the USA and how and why did they change from his first and, and second trip? Mm. Yeah, thanks. Those, that, those are excellent questions. So the first trip that he took um, was in 1892 and he was a young theologian, um, newly married, and um, he'd heard a lot about America growing up because of, so the context that I mentioned before of their, their own government persecuting them, um, that meant that there was a lot of emigration from their denomination from the Netherlands to North America. So you, you, know, you have lots of Dutch seceders who moved to Michigan or who moved to Canada. Uh, so he, he grows up with friends who have emigrated and who write him letters telling him about this new world and, and about Dutch America and America beyond Dutch America. So he's curious about all of that. But the Bavink family themselves were really anti-emigrationist. So it was really normal in their denomination that people did emigrate. And if you read the newspapers, so, the, so their church had its own newspaper. Um, if you read their newspaper, you know, you have... Um, just lots of the adverts um, are all about emigration companies or companies that um, will keep you in touch with your family back at home when you go over to the new world. Um, so you have this um, transatlantic trade in Calvinists going back and forward. Um, and um, so he grows up hearing a lot about America and is curious about it, but also his family are anti-emigrationists and think that it's kind of the worst thing you can do abandon the country you've come from to unbelief and then ship off to the new world. And the, so his father was like this and Herman was like this as well. And I think because of their convictions about the Catholicity of Christianity. So for them, Catholicity, and this is a belief that Herman has really clearly articulated quite young in his life. So the Catholicity of the faith is that Christianity is a faith for um, every culture, for every period of history. So it's, it's never a local faith. So he, ha he has this great line in his um, dogmatics that when he's critiquing Roman Catholicism as being inadequately Catholic, he says that the words Roman and Catholic are mutually contradictory. Uh, you can't be Catholic and have a geographical center where the faith is most fully formed. Uh, instead, Christianity has to take root everywhere. And that also includes your own culture, even if it's really difficult. Um, even if you're persecuted, you don't emigrate. You stay there and contend for the faith. And even if there are all these complexities around you know, a pluralistic democracy, where you have lots of voices all of a sudden that don't agree at all with the Christian faith and make it difficult for Christians, you don't emigrate. If you're a Bavink, you stay and you fight for the faith there. And if you give up on your country, then you've implicitly given up on the Catholicity of Christianity because you're admitting the gospel can't take root here, so we have to take it somewhere else. Um, so they they had these really strong views on emigration as a, as a really bad thing because of what it, they thought it said about the gospel itself um, and, the, and the faith being localized somewhere, but not truly Catholic. Um, so he grows up with this kind of tension of being really curious about America and wanting to see it for himself and hearing about it from his friends, but also having this very strongly anti-emigration influence from his family. So when he went there in 1892, I think the way that he tries to balance those things is he, he adopts this kind of persona of the very cultured traveler. And this is a, um, like a disposition that you adopt when you travel, which is 
intentionally, I will not judge the foreign. I'm going there to observe and to learn and become more cultured. And um, observation is better than judgment. So that's his uh, philosophy of travel. So when he goes there, um, he doesn't want to um, highlight difference. He wants to, and he's quite aware of things that are different and that he probably didn't like uh, as a young man either that were different in America. But by and large, he bites his tongue and he tries to be extremely, at least publicly complimentary about difference. And um, he's not there just to you know, condemn things because they're not the same as they are back at home. So he's really interested in America, such a different culture. Um, he's also sent on that trip as some kind of an ambassador for the neo-Calvinist movement. So it's really um, having a big impact in the Netherlands. They're starting up all kinds of new social institutions, reformed newspapers, a reformed political party, which is the first modern democratic party in the Netherlands. Um, the Free University of, of, of Amsterdam, uh, all these things are happening around them and they're gaining mass democratic support as well. So it's not too much further on from this that Kuiper is elected prime minister. Uh, so you have this neo-Calvinist prime minister then. So he's sent to North America to go to a conference that was in Toronto, um, a, a Presbyterian Congress. And it's something like, um, like in modern day terms, like a Together for the Gospel or a Gospel Coalition Conference. So you have all these conservative evangelicals, mostly Presbyterians, um, from all over the English speaking world, and they all converge in Toronto. And Bavink is sent basically to be a keynote speaker there and to tell them all about neo Calvinism and how much the rest of the reformed world needs to learn from what they're doing in the Netherlands. But he returned from that trip, um, basically thinking uh, Calvinism doesn't really work in America. Um, Calvinism is. Um, it's not really that you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's that you recognize your abject failure before God and you depend on grace alone and nothing else. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's about receptivity to everything that God does for you. And then you obviously act in response out of gratitude, but you don't contribute anything. Like you, you don't bring anything to the deal other than your sin. And he thought that message was something that was um, easy, to, easier to get if you were a European in the late 19th century, because the 19th century in Europe was really hard. Uh, you're talking about war, salvation, a lot of death, uh, or, or starvation, I should say. Uh, you know, so people just didn't have enough food. And that's why a lot of Europeans emigrated to America as well. So European life was really hard. Uh, mainstream Christianity had become really bankrupt theologically. So the church, the kind of mainstream churches just didn't have that much to offer that would give you hope on the basis of Christianity. So then you have all these movements away from that, like the neo-Calvinist movement being one of them to rediscover orthodoxy and to show that actually orthodox theology meets the needs of the day better than liberal theology. So he's part of this context where Calvinism makes a lot of sense in Europe and Europeans, at least in the Netherlands, are really um, buying it. But he went to America and brought the same message, but found that Americans were really optimistic about themselves um, not just in the kind of moralistic sense uh, of, um, but but also just optimistic about their culture. They already had enough to eat. Uh, it's one of his remarks about America. In America, everyone has enough to eat every day, which a lot of Europeans didn't in that period. So he he returned from the the Netherlands as this kind of missionary for for Dutch neo Calvinism and came back and told people in the Netherlands, it's this isn't what they're going to be receptive to. America is the land of Methodism and Arminianism, but probably not the land where everyone is just itching for what they will discover in Calvinism. Um, but he said at the end of, of all these lectures that he gave in the Netherlands about America after that first trip, um, but it's okay because Calvinism isn't the only truth, uh, which confused and or was controversial in the Netherlands for him to say that because he really believed in Calvinism, but he thought even if it doesn't work in America. Um, the the gates of hell will not prevail against the church and the gospel will still spread. He, he basically thought it'll take root and become a distinctively American kind of Christianity, but that the gospel will still take root there. So he had that first trip, but so he's quite like, reserved about his own critiques of things. Um, and his second trip was later in 1908 and he went to give the stone lectures in Princeton, which were really prestigious guest lectures. And at this point, he's older, he's in really stressful circumstances at home, he's become the leader of a political party, it hasn't gone well. Um, Kuiper has been prime minister for one term, but then didn't get re-elected. 
Um, so all the things that they've worked towards are, are facing really challenging circumstances. And um, the trip to America this time is, is just stressful in general. Um, and the first trip, he sails through Canada, through Quebec, and um, he has this, you know, it's, it's all about the grandeur of nature and seeing the glory of God and this vast land that is so different to the Netherlands, this small, very flat country. Um, in the second trip, you know, he sails straight to New York and he's just bombarded with this intensity of, um, you know, people, trying to, everyone's kind of hustling and trying to sell things and um, everyone's trying to make a buck everywhere. And, and there's this kind of jarring clash of extreme wealth and poverty and, uh, so the second trip is really stressful for him and he's in a different phase of life. And I think he's just older and is just less um, ready to bite his tongue when he's given up on the the artful traveler, you know, the patient observer, the non-judgmental observer of the foreign. And um, there's just stuff that he, that he really doesn't like about America, like the public school system, which he thought was, he called it a training ground for unbelief. Um, he he was really struck by racism. Um, I, I assume that he was struck by that in the first trip to America as well, but it's in, after the second trip that he becomes extremely vocal about it. And that's the thing that he gives a lot of lectures on back in the Netherlands, uh, where he, 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 he would tell young people in, in lectures after the second trip, don't emigrate, um, not because it'll be hard to be a Calvinist, which is basically what he said after the first trip, don't emigrate because these people are all Methodists and Arminians. And if you want to stay reformed, stay in the Netherlands. After the second trip, it was um, don't emigrate because you're just safer in the Netherlands. Um, he thought that there's just this racialized hatred that, um, and with a heavily armored um, or heavily armed population um, that has the potential to spill up, spill over into uh, into to war and, and bloodshed, and uh, you know, for him, America is very much an, an experiment. Um, you know, a melting pot of all these different Western Western European cultures all pouring into each other, and then also with the history of, of human enslavement as well. And he thought that all of these things were really volatile. So he was really pretty kind of bleak and apocalyptic about America after his second trip. Um, on the one hand, but the other thing that he discovered in that trip um, was the world missions movement. So um, you have a lot of um, evangelicals in America at this period who see America as having this unique role to play in reaching the whole globe with the gospel within that generation, because you have all of these um, you know, fresh off the boat immigrants in America who then come into contact with the gospel and who are ideally placed then to return to where they've come from as natives, but who've been reached by the gospel in America or, you know, whose children are still fluent in the, the languages that their parents brought with them and who are ideal for a kind of re reverse evangelism process. So all of these ideas are really new to Bavink um, when he goes to America on the second trip and he returns with just a, a fire in his belly for evangelism. Become it's just not something that he spoke about all that much before in his life, uh, at least not with the kind of intensity and regularity that he does after the second trip to America. So it really changes him and making him much more um, visible as an advocate for evangelization in the Netherlands as well as um, as internationally. So he becomes really involved in supporting foreign missionaries and encouraging young Dutch people this time to emigrate, but not to America, but to the the non-Western world as missionaries. So that's the that's the point in his life where he adopts a pro-emigrationist stance, but it's not for personal gain to have a, a materially more comfortable life in America. It's to take the gospel to, to East Asia, for example, or to Indonesia or to Africa. So it changes him very much, actually. Um, he becomes quite a different character. Well, thank you for sharing with us about the trips that Bavink took to America. Um, moving this conversation along into um, one of the thoughts of Bavink in his life, Bavink engaged modern theology and Nietzschean atheism. Uh, he engaged them with different tactics. So what do you think Bavink would say to Christians of Western civilization in America and Europe in this present age? What would he identify as our greatest challenge and what would he encourage us to do to engage it? Mm. Wow, those are really great and huge questions. So for listeners who don't know Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, he was a German atheist, a philosopher who died in 1900 
and who did something very new with atheism, which was to say that, so the atheists who came before Nietzsche in Western Europe said that we don't need God to explain and to carry on the kind of civilization that we have. So we'll be just as moral, but we just don't need God. So God's this awkward piece of the puzzle. And then when you take God out of the puzzle, everything becomes much smoother. And then you can just live honestly and say that none of us really believe in God anyway. But if you take God out of the picture, our moral imagination stays the same. Um, so the, it's just one, it's a convenient absence, um, the absence of God. And that really ran out of steam in the 1890s in Western Europe. And then the thing that Nietzsche had been arguing that was very different was that if you take God out of the picture, of course the moral uh, landscape has to change um, because all of these moral values in Western culture ultimately come from Jesus because Jesus gives Western culture its moral imagination. Um, Jesus is the one who taught us what to think about um, the, the value of life, universal human dignity, um, the value of suffering, um, loving your neighbor, um, thou shalt not kill. Um, all of those things um, are shaped profoundly by Christianity. And if you take God out of the picture, then you have to revalue every value. Like none of them have no, no value pre kind of pre-atheist value has an automatic right just to carry on existing. So instead to become an atheist is to step out or to sail out into completely uncharted waters and you have no idea where this will end up and where things will land just because we have to go through a process of creating entirely new values and they might not be the same as the ones we had before. So that's a very new thing in the history of atheism to say that if God is dead in Nietzsche's language, um, then we have to create a completely new moral structure. And Nietzsche's own solution for how to forge that path forward was to pursue domination. Um, so Nietzsche had this idea that if you had to, well, you, you only have one life for Nietzsche. You know, you're an atheist, you're born, you live, you die, and you only have that one life. And if you had to live that one life over on an infinite loop, would you regret it? If you would, then you have to change the one life that you have. Um, and so it's kind of like YOLO, um, but I think a bit more sinister. So when I teach this to my students, I, I call it YODO. So YOLO, you only live once, um, but YODO is you only dominate once. So for Nietzsche, the thing that you would regret about the one life that you have, if you had to live it over and over in an infinite loop, the thing you would regret is if you were, if you gave yourself over to be passive and weak, and to be dominated by someone else. So the thing you have to strive for is to dominate others. And um, you know, you're, so he called it, it's called the Ubermensch and Untermensch. Um, so the kind of upper human and the lower human. So everyone who dominates needs to have someone else to dominate. Um, so you should want to be the one who dominates. So it's a philosophy of, of might and of domination. Uh, so that's really novel. So Nietzsche says that this is the way that we will move forward having killed God in our moral imaginations. And in Nietzsche's own lifetime, you know, he had really poor mental health in the last years of his life and was really written off by a lot of people. And he was very obscure when he was writing all of this stuff. But he died in 1900 and then all of a sudden became uh, astonishingly popular and really influential also in the Netherlands. And people started to say, yeah, actually, you know, we don't like Jesus. Um, like we don't really have anything good to say about him. And we want uh, a world that's centered on the Ubermensch and this idea of being the strong, dominant human being. And this obviously plays a part then in the history of the 20th century. Um, it's not a surprise that some Nazis really liked uh, Nietzsche as well, although there are kind of controversies over how to interpret him on that kind of stuff, but um, there is a line of influence there. Um, so this becomes a really big thing and Bavinck has to, to respond to it. Uh, and he, in the last two decades of his life, really the, the key issue that faces Western culture is the clash between Jesus and Nietzsche because Jesus tells you um, to love those who are weak and vulnerable, um, to love the disabled, to love the unborn, to love the elderly. Um, and Jesus teaches you to take the place of the servant rather than the one who will always dominate and be stronger and push other people down beneath yourself. But Bavinck saw that, um, that in the Western world, although it had been historically shaped by Christianity, 
in the early 20th century, it had been become completely estranged from Christianity. Um, so talking about Jesus um, doesn't immediately grab hold of the imaginations of all the secularized people around you, Western people, as though they'll say, of course, yeah, Jesus. So therefore I should, um, you know, I should I shouldn't pursue domination and might and always being the one who has power over others. Um, that just doesn't work as easily as it did in previous centuries when pre Nietzsche, basically. So that's the direction that he saw things going in. And he was really fearful for what the rest of the 20th century would look like. He thought it would be a period where you would have strongman political dictators, where you would have this Nietzsche and philosophy becoming the philosophy of nations as well, and all trying to have this race for domination, a really immoral or amoral race for domination. So I think that the way that the 21st century has gone is that we're still locked in the same battle between Christ and Nietzsche that Bavinck thought that had begun. Um, so I'm not sure if, if um, things would surprise him. Uh, if I could give you one example from my own context in Scotland, for example, um, at the moment. So, you, you know, we've, we're emerging from lockdown now and we've been in lockdown for you know, over a year and the economy has taken a huge hit. It's been really hard for everyone, uh, all kinds of challenging circumstances um, with living in lockdown. But the reason that people have been willing to do it and our political leaders wanted this to, to be the way we dealt with the pandemic was that if we don't, well, coronavirus is really dangerous for elderly people. So we have sacrificed a huge amount as a society in order to save the lives of um, people who are um, you know, 70, 80, 90 years old, um, who are not seen as economically productive according to their, the kind of economic models that are that at least my country runs on, but we've sacrificed our economy for them. Um, and that there is, I think, a, a profoundly Christian moral imagination that, that guides that kind of a choice, that you let your economy take a huge hit in order to save um, life for um, elderly people. But then as soon as this is all over, waiting in the wings, there will be a big push in Scotland for euthanasia, um, which will primarily affect elderly people. And the pressure that will come on them is, it costs a lot to keep you alive. Um, wouldn't it be better for you and for your family if um, if we had euthanasia? So th that will be the, the big push that will follow up. Um, everything that we've just sacrificed to try and give a, older generations in our society um, life. And within that, I think that encapsulates the battle that the Western the Western world is in between again, Christ and Nietzsche. Uh, if you read Nietzsche, um, for him, you know, once you're not capable of physically dominating, your life is over anyway. And uh, you know, he didn't have good things to say about the value of, of helping elderly people to live longer. Um, but that's a distinctly Christian thing that he was rejecting. So I think that Western culture is still locked in the same battle that, that, Bavinck, um, that Bavinck saw had begun. And Bavinck's uh, approach to this is always to emphasize Christ, um, that, that Christ does change everything. And that um, even if you have all the diversity of you know, what Christianity has come to look like in Western history, um, across lots of different traditions and denominations, at the core of it all, is Christ and we're all grappling with him and trying to make sense of him and respond to him and work out how to live in the light of him. But if you remove Christ in the first place in the Nietzschean sense, then you, you do sail into a, an unknown land and uh, it's just not clear where things will, will end up. So for Bavington, that's all the more reason to, to pursue um, Christ-centered thinking about what it means to, to be human and to live in the world. Perhaps this next question will be a little bit less weighty. Um, both Austin and I are, are pastors. We, we preach every Lord's Day. And Bob Inc., though, though he was not a, pre a pastor long, he, he did preach several hundred sermons at the very least, if not more. Um, and what can we as, as preachers learn about him? And what, what do we know about Bob Inc. as a preacher? Mm. We know a few key details. 
like that he preached hundreds and hundreds of sermons across his lifetime. Um, he also came from a preaching culture where preaching with a manuscript was um, looked down on would be to put this um, mildly. Um, if you preach with a manuscript, it was um, it's just not the done thing at all, and you'd be heavily criticized for that. So you should preach with minimal or no notes. Um, so that's why we don't have lots of manuscripts of Bavik sermons, because although he preached all the time across his lifetime, um, he, he just didn't leave notes. <laughs> so we know the texts that he preached on because he would record them in his, in his diaries. Um, but we don't know how he preached beyond one key sermon, which he preached and um, it's a really fascinating sermon. And there was a public demand for it to be made available because it was in the context of the Boer War in South Africa, which was a war between the English and the Afrikaners. And the Afrikaners you know, are Dutch descendants, they're Calvinist farmers. And the leader of the Afrikaner resistance against the English was in the Netherlands, I guess, trying to drum up support. And he turned up at church and Bavink was preaching. So he preached a sermon on, um, on his, it's one of his life texts um, from First John. Um, this is our faith, which has overcome the world. Um, and it's a text that he preached on many, many times across his lifetime. So it's it's really handy that we have that as a pretty representative sermon. Um, but also he he's addressed the political context in South Africa and the sermon. And um, the sermon was explicitly political. And he used the faith of the, the humble Afrikaner Calvinist farmers in standing up against the the, the global might of, of the English with superior weaponry and technology. Um, so he used that as an example of, of the faith of the reformed in standing up against um, kind of David and Goliath kind of battle. Um, so because of that, then there was a big public clamor. People wanted to know what he had said when this guy was in the congregation. So he writes that he tried to remember what he'd said and he thinks this is an accurate record of that, and then it was published. So that's translated, um, and that, that's in my book, Having Come Preaching and Preachers. Um, and the, another one of the, the, the things that's in that book is a text that he wrote called Eloquence, and that was originally a series of lectures on how to preach uh, or how to be a preacher. So for Bavink, in order to preach, in the first place, you have to have become a particular kind of person. Um, you have to be someone who's... Like the core of your being has to be profoundly shaken and affected by God um, and by his glory in the world around you. Uh, and you know, so you see the greatness of his mind in the world that he has made. And then you see the greatness of his heart in the incarnation of his son and everything that his son has done to redeem. So you have to be profoundly shaken and stirred by those things. And then having become that, then the goal of the preacher is to communicate that to others in a way that speaks straight into their souls as well. So this book, Eloquence, is his account of what that means, how to become a truly eloquent person, which isn't really about grammar or you know, elocution of you know, how you pronounce your vowels or anything like that. It's that you're eloquent in that you're in step with the the glory of God in creation and redemption. So we know a lot from that about how he trained preachers and that's there in that book as well. So I think those two together give you something fairly representative. You have uh, mentioned some biographies that you were talking about in the second question we asked. And of course, uh, we have your uh, critical biography now on Herman Bovink as a resource to study. Uh, Herman Bovink, but for someone wanting to learn more about Bovink and read some of his writings, where should they start? Mm. Um, I think if you want to get to grips with him, then biography is a good place to begin because it will set everything in a context. And that's part of, so I love reading biographies of theologians as well as reading their works because because theology happens in the real world and not in, um, in some kind of blank space. So it really helps me understand what this person is doing as they write, if I know a bit about where they're from and what they were trying to address um, in their own immediate context. So if you're looking for a biography, then my one is out there. And I've tried to write it in a way that will then help readers 
um, pick up particular you know, books by Bavinck from different points of his life and understand you know, why did he write a book on Christian worldview in the time that he did? Or why did he write four volumes of dogmatics um, and so on? So um, I think if you're looking for a very first introduction to Bavinck, I think the gold standard out there right now is his book, The Wonderful Works of God. So he wrote that as a one volume summary of his four volume dogmatics. He, and he wrote it for people who don't have a degree in theology. So he expects that you know, you'll be a, a book lover if you're going to read that. And it's still hundreds of pages long, but the chapters are all very short and they're, they're really accessible. They're devotional in character. Um, so that I think is, is just a fantastic book as a first introduction to Bavinck. Um, I, I don't think I've ever met anyone who's read it and said that they just gave up on it and that they were disappointed. Um, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful book as a one volume. Um, I think for preachers who are interested in Bavinck, um, then the book that I mentioned, Herman Bavinck on Preaching and Preachers, is quite short, um, but it helps you see what it looked like for him to take this theological project from his writing desk or from his um, lecture hall and take it into the pulpit and actually turn this into theology that you can preach. Um, there are some other, I mean, he, he wrote a lot, obviously. Um, if you're interested in Bavinck in terms of something like apologetics, um, his book, Philosophy of Revelation, I think is, is outstanding. Um, it's the, So that was based on the lectures that he gave in Princeton, the Stone Lectures. And the key idea in the, in that book is that everybody lives in practice as though revelation happens, as though God self-discloses. Um, so no atheist truly lives by his or her creed. Um, everyone lives as though revelation happens. And so he makes that argument across things like you know, to have a concept of history, we actually assume something outside of history. We assume revelation to have a concept of culture, to have a concept of religion, to have a concept of the future. So he goes through all of these and argues why it's reasonable to believe in revelation. And he kind of tries to put the shoe on, or tries to put the burden on the person who says, no, the world is completely self-enclosed. There's no God who speaks into it. He puts the burden on that person to say, well, how do you account for the lives that we all actually live? We all act as though God is there. Um, even if we deny it, you know, vehemently. So that's, I think, is a really skillful work in, um, in apologetics as well. Um, yeah, I recommend those as a, a very good starting point. And if you're really serious, uh, then the Reform Dogmatics is a, is a superb reference work. If you put in the time to read all four volumes, you won't regret it. And I echo earlier, as you said, your biography is is a good place to to start, or at least I very much found it informative and, and helpful in my understanding of Bob Inc. Um, do you have any final encouragements for our audience as it relates to Bob Inc. or, or anything else? Mm, I think so. I think I could return to what I said earlier about um, Bob Inc. and Catholicity. And you know, I said before that he was so against emigration because of what he thought it implied about Christianity not being Catholic. And even when your circumstances are difficult um, in terms of following Christ faithfully in your own particular cultural points, um, that's what you're called to do. But he had com but Bavink had a lot of confidence in the, the historic Christian faith as something that has all of the resources um, for faithfulness to the gospel. Um, in whichever point in history you're from, it's it's not a local faith. It is truly Catholic and it can take root in and then it's sanctific sanctifying power then applies to um, uh, whichever part of the world it takes root in. And I think you know, that that would be, I mean, that's a kind of take home from his work for anyone in the world at, a, at any point in history when they read this. Um, you know, a hundred years on, I mean, did Bavink think that we would all be reading his works and talking about them? I am, I'm not sure that he would have because he thought the 20th century was going to be so unpredictable and you know, he, he didn't try and guess what was going to happen beyond the dictators and more war that would come. Um, he is still a great resource, um, I think, if anything, because he shows us in his own example how to use those resources of the historic Christian faith and how to really dig deep within them and then use that to push things forward in, in your own context and history as well. So I think you know, 
we can learn from Bavink and um, in that way, I think that's a really encouraging thing. I derive a lot of encouragement from him in that regard. We have been talking with Dr. James Eglinton. Is that correct? Is that the correct pronunciation? That, that is who I am indeed. <laughs> yeah. All right. We have been talking with Dr. James Eglinton about Bavink as well as his critical biography about Bob Inc. Um, thank you for, for coming on the show, James. Thanks for having me. It was really glad to talk with you both. And to our listeners, we wish you grace and peace. For additional content, check out our blog ministry at covenantconfessions.com. Also, keep up with our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Next, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. Lastly, Thank you for listening to the Covenant Podcast. Grace and peace to you.